Today we have a very uh, exciting topic slightly outside of the um, direct technology sphere and that is the evolution and the future of uh, the chief people officer. Um, this is obviously um, usually central to our world at SANA but also outside of it uh, and we're really really excited about it so super great to have so many people joining in for this session today. Um, we'll get to introductions because uh, I think that's where the fireworks will start but before that I just want to give you guys a couple of ground rules for the session today. So what we'll do is we'll primarily use these ways of communicating with each other. So you have, if you just want to give like a, a minor reaction to something, you have the reaction button at the, the bottom of the screen. Uh, it's the little gray uh, smiley where you can select an, a reaction among the alternatives or you can look for a wider variety if you, if you click at the bottom one. You can uh, also click the hand raise button if you want to speak or give a comment. I'm sure a lot of interesting things will be presented today, so don't hesitate to raise your hand and give a comment on what's being said. You can also use the chat. You access the chat in the top right corner where you can write uh, just uh, casual things or ask questions. And you can even add, uh, create threads where you respond to things that are written in the chat. And so you can have separate uh, uh, conversations there if you'd like as well and uh, yeah just uh, to emphasize that again this is going to be an interactive se session so don't hesitate to to give your input to what's being said and uh, with that said let's uh, kick it off um, so my name is Emil I'm a director of business development here at Sana Labs I've uh, been with the company uh, two and a half years now and it's been a crazy journey uh, I'm not the focal point today. I have somebody much more interesting with me and that's Lars Schmidt, who's our very special guest. Um, Lars is the founder of Amplify. He's an author of uh, a best-selling book, who, which is Redefining HR. You're a podcaster, a newsletter creator, and much, much more. Um, Lars, what does your days look like? You're doing uh, a shit ton of things. Excuse my language. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, Emil, it's good to be here with you, and uh, thanks to all of you for joining us um, here today, this morning or afternoon uh, or evening, depending on wherever you are in the world. Um, so I'm the founder of a company called Amplify. Uh, as Emil mentioned, my, my bio is already embarrassingly long, so I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, I try to get involved in projects that accelerate the field of HR and people operations, and really, that's kind of at my core what I try to do. So, you know, newsletter, podcast, academy, you know, those things are all connected to that, but that kind of mission for me is central. So that's really uh, what kind of drives and motivates me and helps steer the types of projects uh, that I get involved in. Uh, amazing, Lars. So really, really happy to be able to host you today. Um, I'm super excited about this session. Uh, I got a sneak peek just before, of course, and uh, it's going to be great. Uh, before we get started with it, it would be amazing to just know the audience a bit better here today to make it even, even better. So this is a reflection card. The white box is where you can write an answer um, to the questions that are posed here about the white box. Um, you can click skip, uh, click skip if you don't want to answer it. That's also fine. Uh, but after you submit a response, you will be able to see what everybody else said as well. Um, so I'm excited about just getting to know everyone who's joining in today uh, and where you're from, what you're doing, and what you're most interested in learning about. And uh, it's a lot of typing going on, so I think we'll get some good responses here. Okay, we can we can take that one in the in the Q and A at the end. But uh, 
uh, only, only for people who stay in the session will uh, will get to know how much coffee I drink in a day. We have Rebecca from Gothenburg, who's a product owner. Christine Vinya from from Canada, CPO at the Gero Labs, that, dialing in from Waterloo. Maria Alexel from Kru. Beverly Tuxel dialing in from Crested Butt, Colorado. Oh, a lot of interesting people here. We need to save this somehow, Jenny, as we go along. So no, no pressure here, Lars, but uh, we've got a stellar audience here today. So it's, uh, it's time to deliver. All right, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. Uh, I think we're uh, wrapping up on the comments. If people want to add any last things here, um, you can press it in. Otherwise, I think we're ready to, to move on. All right, let's go. So uh, today's agenda is uh, the evolution of the CPO, the future of the CPO. And Lars will wrap up with three things to get started today. Uh, Lars, anything you want to add to the agenda before we get started with um, the different tasks? Um, no, just that, you know, we're going to try to make this interactive. Um, so we'll have some time for questions at the end. But I also encourage all of you to be responding uh, in the chat group. Use that as your, <clears throat> excuse me, your open forum during the session. So if you have a perspective or an opinion or you disagree with anything that uh, you're hearing from us, jump into the chat, share your thoughts, because uh, we really want you to be able to connect with each other during the session today. Um, really, really cool. Uh, so what we'll start with is just another reflection card um very quickly on how you all think the chief people officer has evolved and uh, that's obviously the first topic of the day and Lars will share some thoughts here but it would be good to guess, get uh, some initial thoughts here on your opinions about how the role of the chief people officer has changed or evolved in recent time Some great ideas already. Eva, I'm glad you didn't use human capital in that reference. <laughs> Johanna spot on as usual. Shift happiness officer. That's a new one. That is, and that's such a difficult expectation to put on HR, right? Because I think happiness is such an intrinsic individual um, thing. I think uh, it's funny that, that that could be another webinar, right? Of like that, that conversation, that expectation, because I think it's, uh, it's tough. It does happen and we do see it, but I think there's obviously a culture element to our role. Um, you know, but 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 you know, the state of happiness is such an individual thing um, that it's you know, if there's an expectation that we make employees happy, 
uh, I think that's an expectation we can't meet. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's very interesting though, but I think it's a great, it's a great point because I think that that is part of the way that the role is evolving in our conversations around the expectations uh, for the CPO is evolving as well. I'm almost relieved that I'm not seeing chief pandemic officer because we had seen that front and center for the last, uh, you know, a couple of years, not to say that we're not still uh, experiencing that, but um, the demands of that aspect of how the role has evolved over the last couple of years have been exhausting uh, for, for leaders in the field. So, um, you know, optimistic that we are, are beginning to, well, we have turned that corner and hopefully are accelerating away from that, uh, that moment in time. Some really, really interesting comments here. I think, Lars, do you, do you want to highlight anything else before we move on to your uh, to your first uh, part of the presentation? Or um, no, I just I appreciate all of you sharing. I mean, I think one of the one of the key things that kind of goes back to my point earlier about uh, adding a chat. Like, sure, I have uh, opinions and views, and, and you're signed up for this, so I'm going to share those with you. Uh, but you all do as well, and you all have a tremendous amount of experience uh, as well. So I think what makes these uh, events interesting is when you can learn not just from the the presenters, but also from each other. So keep these thoughts coming uh, during the session. I'd love to see them. Yeah, it, it does seem uh, like there's uh, a generally a strong opinion about the HR and people becoming more important in the C-suite. Uh, so I think a lot of people will be interested to hear a comment on that today uh, and uh, I, essentially how that changes uh, the importance of the role and the pressures that come with it as well. I think it does seem like um, people think it's both exciting and challenging. So interesting to hear some comments from you that, uh, about that as well, Lars. Yeah. Um, Away from admin and following rules towards understanding people and their needs and wants, encouraging self-development and growth. I hope we touch upon that as well as we go along. Really exciting stuff. But I think, yeah, I'm excited to hear what Lars has to say. So I'm switching uh, slides now. Do you want to go ahead and share your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, all of the things that you all shared are are spot on. So kind of what I add will be um, in addition to what you shared. Look, I think that to me, when I think of the CPO role today, it's, you know, the hardest job in the C-suite. Maybe next to the CEO, you know, that, that arguably might, you might make a case that that's harder. But I would put the CPO in terms of challenging aspects of the role up against any of the C-suite peers. And there's a reason for that. I think when you look at how the field of HR has evolved, you look at how the function has evolved, and you look at how the expectations and the complexity of the environment we're operating in has evolved, um, that's put a lot of pressure on the role itself to evolve. And like historically, you know, the field of HR was pretty insular. You kind of came in as an associate, worked your way up to, you know, senior manager, director of VP, it was a linear career path. And, you know, oftentimes those CHROs came up from within the field. Um, I think when you look at the role today, uh, yes, that profile still exists, but you find a lot of people who are moving into that role from other areas of the business. You're finding people who maybe started in HR, moved into the business, moved back into HR. Um, people who, you know, the paths of people coming and going into the field have dramatically, uh, you know, accelerated the innovation and evolution of the field because we're not just looking at the challenges that our businesses face and our employees face through a quote unquote HR lens. And so getting back to the challenging aspect of the CPO, you have to understand, you know, this is what, you know, we all talk about business acumen is this coveted skill and, and it's not necessarily new. I think CHROs and CPOs have always needed that, but it's been really magnified. I think over the last couple of years, as we navigate just the complexity of the world of work today. And so when you look at the CPO today, you have to understand the go-to-market strategy. 
like a chief revenue officer. You have to understand the market positioning like a CMO. You have to understand the you know, IT strategy like a CIO. Um, and you have to understand and really deeply understand the business strategy and the environment that you're operating in. Uh, and then not only that, you have to take the understanding of all of those functions and you need to distill that into a dynamic talent and people strategy that supports the overall business goals and missions. And that strategy oftentimes now is not static, right? You uh, remember back in 2000 when we thought static, you know, systems and, you know, HR playbooks were the way to go. That's how we operated for decades. And then came along COVID and blew everything up. And, you know, we're now a couple of years into this next chapter of not just HR, but the world of work. We're rewriting what used to be pretty firm playbooks that maybe incrementally evolved with time. And now in some cases we're writing entirely new ones. And so that's a big responsibility for the field. Uh, Johannes mentioned the props, you know, around seat at the table. We're only allowed to use that if we're speaking ironically uh, now, like there's no more question about whether we have a seat that we're there. So what are we doing with it? How are we leveraging the, the visibility and the clout uh, and the power that in some organizations we didn't have that we do now? And, and, and I want to actually back up from that comment because I know that might be uh, a bolder statement. And I do want to recognize one thing, and that's that the field of HR is a spectrum, right? So you have the leading edge of the field, much of what I'm talking about in terms of best in class people teams, the way that I talk about, uh, you know, hey, we, we, you know, there's no more seat at the table conversation. We're there. We're involved in every aspect of the decision making for the business, et cetera, et cetera. I'm mostly talking about that leading edge of the field. I think if you go to the other side of the spectrum, you know, there are still a lot of teams that are operating in more of a personnel, transactional, administrative type HR environment through no fault of their own necessarily. That's just what the business expects from the function. And the vast majority of our peers are, are in the middle. And so they have the opportunity to move more towards that leading edge. And I think, again, when you talk about the evolution of the CPO role, one of the things that I'm, I'm most excited about is, you know, yes, we've been through some really hard times as humans, right? As societies, not just uh, within the HR field. I think HR, field, HR in particular has felt the brunt of that challenge because we were on the front lines of all of those events, whether it was, you know, geopolitical conflict, COVID, social justice, remote work, whatever it might be, choose the massive, you know, issue that we've been dealing with. And we're having to deal with them as, uh, as a trusted advisor to the C-suite, kind of helping our leadership team navigate through the turmoil, a trusted advisor to our employees, helping them navigate through, trusted advisor to our teams who are carrying a lot of this, emotional, you know, trauma and, and challenge of supporting employees who are having real hardships in these times. And then as an individual, and that's a lot of layers to experience trauma after trauma after trauma over the last couple of years. And so you've got to be resilient to be in this field. But what I'm really excited about, uh, and I'll kick it back to you, Emil, is that when you look at the field today, particularly the, the model of, of uh, you know, CPOs, successful CPOs today, one of the two common things that they have in, in common. One is they're huge believers in community and building networks. And, you know, I've had the privilege of talking to over a hundred CPOs on my redefining work podcast and all of them, literally every single one has talked about how their peer networks have allowed them to get through these difficult times, difficult circumstances. And then the other component is open source. So, uh, you know, if you know me, you know, I'm a huge proponent of open source. And I think that the field, particularly, you know, pandemic was a big springboard towards more companies embracing open source. You know, now you can find resources, you can find templates, you can find practices. Even if you're in one of those HR teams, that's more at the, the laggard end of the spectrum. As an individual, if you're curious and you want to develop your career, you have so many avenues to do that. So I think it's, uh, you know, all of those things point to the evolution of the role and more broadly the evolution of the field. I, I mean, there's a richness to that comment, uh, <laughs> which uh, I, I hope uh, we can touch on only like parts of it during this session today, but super interesting response, uh, Lars. And I think tying back to the, this initial first uh, topic out of three uh, for today, we're getting some comments from the chat and I hope we can respond to those as well. 
But uh, initially, what do you think was the trigger for this shift? Because I, there seems to be uh, a joint understanding that it is exactly like how you mentioned it, and there's been a, a big, big change from only a few years ago. So what really caused that, do you think? Yeah, I mean, like, I think we were, you know, we were beginning to evolve at a more rapid pace before the pandemic, but certainly the pandemic was the, you know, poured gas on everything that was happening. And in some cases blew up things and in some cases accelerated things. And I think, you know, you, you have, look at look at remote work, for example. There was a study by McKinsey in the early, in the year one of the pandemic that interviewed, you know, hundreds of CEOs and asked their perspectives on timelines around different transformational efforts. Uh, and one of the questions was around, you know, shifting to remote work. And on average, they expected that would be, uh, take 410 days to accomplish. We did it in 10. Now, granted, the pandemic is a great forcing function to drive innovation, but so much of this stems from that, right? We, we, had, we hit remote work at a scale that we had never experienced. We started talking about, uh, you know, mental health and employee well-being and wellness and burnout in ways that we hadn't talked about before. We started talking about workplace flexibility and priorities. You know, it wasn't long ago that we were in this, you know, work culture that glorified hustle and grind and, you know, everybody wore busyness like a badge of honor. Like, how busy are you? Oh, super busy. How busy are you? I'll be more busier, right? Like, that was very lame. But now I think there's this sense of balance that's kind of come back. And there's a lot of employees who, you know, I think really the, the, the idea of flexibility and choice is the biggest uh, kind of uh, shift from where we were to where we are now. And that means that, you know, we've come out of decades of industrial era constructs of work that tightly dictated like when, where, and how you work. And that's now all changing. And now it's not, you know, it's not all remote. It's not all hybrid. It's, it's flexible. It's, it's choice. It's how you can meet employees where they want to be met uh, and think about designing programs that can adapt to the, you know, meet the needs of the business while adapting to the desires of the employees. It, it feels like you think that the employees gained also a bit more sort of power in the business that is them getting fed through the chief people officer in companies. Would, would that be a correct interpretation of what you're saying to some extent? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, look, I think, uh, you know, and it, it's obviously there's, there's economic conditions that are also feeding into this. You know, it was a year ago that we were still in what many people called the great resignation or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, the job market was on fire. In particular for HR, we've never had a job market like that. You know, you couldn't hire a CPO. You couldn't hire a sourcer on a recruiting team. You know, sourcers were getting six-figure salaries, you know, a year or two out of college. And, like, yes, that was a bubble. But still, I think we went from this place of record demand to, you know, the, the, the economy is kind of right-sizing a little bit right now. Um, but I think it's really just elevated the field. And in particular, going back to that point around the pandemic, companies who had historically underinvested in HR – um, they, they viewed it more as an administrative, administrative function. They felt the pain in year one of the pandemic because they didn't have the systems that could adapt and be agile and, and, and basically shift with the times as they were required. And they were very exposed from that. And so I think that's also part of what led to this idea of the great resignation in HR specifically is you had you know, so many companies who historically hadn't really invested as much in the function now realize, oh, wait a minute, this is really important. And this is actually really strategic. This isn't just a cost center. Uh, we need to think about this differently. That, that's super interesting. And I think it ties, uh, especially as you touch upon teams within HR as well. Beverly wrote the comment in the chat saying that CPOs need to be able to translate um, essentially the importance of the role and the function to their own people and connecting the dots from, you know, like what, what, has typically been specifically HR type of work and how that um, reinforces the entirety of the business. Uh, and also that being a changing role uh, compared to how it's been historically. W what do you think about that comment? Um, look, I, I think the, the expectations of a CPO are not just HR anymore. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree with the comment and I would expand on it by saying, you know, I kind of you know, joked about the idea that the CPO is a chief pandemic officer. Um, and I wish I could take credit for that one. I can't. That was Tiffany Stevenson, uh, Weight Watchers CPO. So I just want to cite the source uh, and give full credit on that. But, but she's right. But it's not just chief pandemic officer. It's chief communications officer. It's chief crisis communications officer. It's chief, uh, you know, retention officer. I mean, 
the expectations for the role go so much deeper than just HR. And I think it also reinforces why one of the mo- most important skill sets for CPOs today is being effective communicators, right? And it's not just the ability to give a good speech. It's not just the ability to write a great memo. Um, it's the ability to leverage tools. It's the ability to think about visual communication. It's the ability to think about video communication. And so I think that there's just, there's so many, you could look at any, you know, one of those lenses on how the expectations for the field have evolved. And you're right. I think to your point, the, you know, we also have to do a better job of communicating those changes and what we do and the value we bring to the business. Because I think mm-hmm. there, you know, historically when you say HR, generally speaking, because lots of people have experienced bad HR, there's a stigma associated with that of like policy cops and compliance. And yes, we were rooted in compliance. That's kind of where the function came from. That's not who we are today. And so we have to do a better job of telling those stories of the work that we're doing today so that people can really see how that's changed and build more trust uh, with our employees. Yeah. So I I think that's an amazing comment again. And and then a, it seems like also from the comments in the chat and what we heard earlier that there is a large consensus about the changing of the role and how much wider it is now than it was previously. Um, with that said, I'd like to pivot into the next uh, discussion um, of today, which is around the future of the chief people officer. Obviously, we've now teed it up to 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 really have an interesting discussion here, but. Lars, would you just like to, with the background of what you just spoke about with how it was before the pandemic came, a lot of changes happened, um, the employees gained a lot more power and uh, the HR or the people person has now expanded outside of just being an HR person into something much wider. What do you think is the future of the people officer? You know, look, I think, and, and I'll kind of, I'll try not to be redundant with anything that I've, I've shared in terms of how the role has evolved, but I think, you know, the, the future of the role is this is a, a C-suite strategic position on par with every other role in the C-suite. And it wasn't always that, right? I think a lot of times there's organizations that might, you know, you kind of have like the CMO, or the chief revenue officer and the CTO and the CEO, and then, oh, maybe the chief legal officer and, you know, the chief HR officer, and maybe they were... Uh, they're viewed as like a rung below that other, uh, those other kind of peers. And that's not the case anymore. Certainly it's not the case of any company you want to work for. Um, and so I think that's a big shift. I think that the, um, the focus on, and I know we'll touch on this a little bit later, but, you know, two really important things <clears throat> that I think drive our future are, uh, you know, the real focus on both learning agility and network equity. And that applies across the field, but absolutely uh, it's a crucial point for the CPO and how they think about their role. And I think, uh, you know, not to go Ted Lasso on you, but also just being curious, right? You've got to be curious. So the world, you know, I'd love to be able to sit here and say, uh, you know, the, what we've experienced the last couple of years is a blip and we're going to be going back to a very stable, predictable, calm world. I don't think we are. I think that these kind of, you know, VUCA or however you want to frame them times that we're in to some extent or another, and hopefully on the lower end of that, is here to stay. And so, you know, it's not enough to know your craft. It's not enough to understand the business. It's not enough to understand your other businesses, leaders, teams, and roles and functions. You've got to have a range of external data points outside or data inputs, I should say, uh, outside of even your field to know what's happening in the bigger world and how that might impact your, your business your employees, your workforce, the talent you're trying to recruit. So, you know, there, again, going back to that point, the, the future of the, the role will continue to be critical, um, but also incredibly complex. So essentially we're, we're really talking about an expanding scope here, right? Then that also comes with an expanding influence in the business I, I think Sally mentioned something here in the chat, which is certainly is worth mentioning as well, uh, that uh, in comparison with, for example, somebody in finance, finance except, uh, expects HR to understand uh, the finance function now. Just like you mentioned, the CPO needs to understand all of the different legs of the business, but it doesn't always go the other way around. It, it's not always 
uh, that the CFO understands what the CPO do, does on a day-to-day -day basis. How, how do you yeah. think about that power structure and what would you do about it? Yeah, I mean, like, honestly, I think you can't expect your CFO to understand HR like you do. Um, and so I would just, I would start there. What you can do is, I mean, ultimately your ability to, again, getting, you know, you mentioned the CFO specifically, so that may be getting funding or budget for projects and obviously the CEO um, getting support for projects. As a CPO, your most important relationship is with your CEO. Prioritize that over everything else, even your team. And I don't mean that to say neglect your team or anything else, but if you don't have that trusted advisor relationship that in some cases that kind of coach uh, relationship with your CEO, it's going to be really hard for you to be effective in your role. And so I would almost cascade the, the relationships and the priorities as CEO, uh, C-suite peers, team, you know, board, if you, uh, if you're in a public company or a company that has a, an operating board um, and then employees. And you have to think about your time in those ways, because if you don't have the trust and the relationship and the bonds with your CEO and your C-suite peers, you might have the best plans in the world. You might be the most innovative people leader on planet earth, but you're not going to be successful because you're not going to be able to get things done. And, and I think in particular from a, a finance standpoint, this is where that business acumen comes into play. Uh, really being able to understand when you're trying to pitch investment in a new tool or a product, what is the ROI of that investment? What is the ROI of, what is the cost of not making that investment? You know, speak their language, particularly the CFO, because obviously they are thinking about the financials and the numbers first, second, and third. So like, you've got to be able to speak in their language. I don't think that we can expect them to come to ours. So that would be my advice. And uh, interesting comment uh, here from Jimmy, supplementing that uh, discussion a little bit with all the new expectations and asks of the CPO doesn't always mean additional support and resources, but I agree building the, that trust with CEO and CFO can influence that. Uh, sure, yeah. comment on that before we go on to the next. Yeah, question. I'd love to jump on that. And, and Ginny, I'm so glad you raised that point. Um, you know, this is, it was interesting. This is also a question that I often ask um, CPOs who are on my podcast. And um, I remember specifically, actually, uh, Anna Bender, who is Asana's chief people officer, um, she joined uh, one of my Amplify Academy cohorts uh, as a guest instructor. And we were talking about that specifically. And again, she has a really great relationship with their founder and CEO that she's developed over years. So again, this starts with that relationship. But because she has that relationship and because she has the business acumen and the financial fluency to be able to communicate from a number standpoint, um, when her team is tasked and asked to do more, she will basically lay things out. Okay, here's what we're working on. Here's what we're funded to work on. If you're asking me to do these other things, it either needs to come with the funding to be able to do that, or you need to carve something out to make space for that. Those are your two choices, but I'm not going to just take it on and spread my team thin. And again, you know, you can have that conversation when you have a real trusted relationship with your CEO, but I think that's a game changer. And that, that kind of speaks to the, the business acumen and the financial liter literacy and fluency. We can't just be expected to just take on more and more and more and more without resources. And let's be real. We have been. That's exactly the reality. I think most of you have seen over the last couple of years, but I think this is, again, this really kind of touches on the importance of the business acumen piece, being able to lay it out in that way and say, okay, you want to add this scope? These are the resources we need to do that effectively. Uh, or we can't get resources. What are we taking away? So we have the ability to do that. So You're teeing up really well here for, for the next part, which is really um, tying back to the current situation of the CPO, expanded, expanded the influence, expanded expectations but maybe not always um, getting all of the resources needed and dealing with that entire situation. So what do you think are some good tips for CPOs moving into this new expanded role? Yeah, I mean, so I think there's a couple of things. Um, I touched on one of them, which is, you know, prioritize that relationship with your CEO above all else and your C-suite, you know, kind of like 1A and 1B. Uh, and that, that's where your success is going to come from or not. It's not going to be about your, you know, the innovation of your projects. It's not going to be about um, how successful you are in, uh, you know, lowering time to fill or employee engagement or, or, you know, retention. 
all those things are important, but they're secondary to those relationships. If you have those relationships, good things come from that. And if you don't, it's really hard to be successful in the role. So I think that would be one piece. Um, the second would be, and I mentioned this earlier, uh, learning agility, right? You've got to make time for learning if you really want to have a career as a CPO. There's just too much change that's happening inside the organization, outside the organization, in the broader geopolitical sense. Um, and if you're not dialed into what those things are, if you can't be that the voice of that to your C-suite peers, you're going to struggle. It's going to be a hard time keeping up. And imagine now the power you have when you do do that, when you are well-read, when you do have a great understanding of all these different dynamics, and you can sit in your C-suite meetings and say, hey, um, this thing is happening in this part of the world, um, and we need to keep an eye on it because it may actually have a broader impact on our workforce and our ability to uh, attract and retain talent. So, you know, that learning agility. And again, you know, the simple tip for all of you right now, if nothing else, if nothing else, take 30 minutes in your calendar every week, block it. It's a standing meeting. This is your learning time. Hopefully it can be more than 30 minutes, but I know that you're all super busy. So if nothing else, 30 minutes and, and that's blocked. You don't let people book over it. You defend that time. And that's a time where you, you know, read those articles that your friends have sent you or that you saw on you know, LinkedIn or Twitter that you thought were interesting. You listen to that podcast. Uh, you invest in yourself because I think the investments, we have to be a little bit more selfish about our own careers and our own development in HR and specifically for CPOs as well. You know, the time we invest in ourselves through learning is time that pays dividends for our companies, for ourselves, for our teams. So, you know, some people look at that as like, oh, but I have so much, you know, I have to deliver for the business and you do. But if you're not also making space to deliver for yourself, you're going to be, you know, you're going to struggle to keep up. So that would be another piece I would say. Um, and then one more I would say would be uh, network equity. Um, and we've all talked about networking for, you know, years and I'm not really talking about networking. I'm talking about being very thoughtful and deliberate about proactively cultivating a diverse network of people inside your discipline, peers, and even outside your discipline that you can call on for help and support uh, as you need it. Because when you invest in network equity, think about it today in, in this kind of you know, global network world that we're in, it's not just about the knowledge that you, the knowledge or skills that you have in your head or your hands, it's about the knowledge and skills that you have access to. And if you've been proactively building a diverse network and you may be tasked with a problem at work you've never seen before. You have no idea where to start. But you know two or three people in your network who've done that exact same thing, who you can call and say, hey, you know what? I just got asked to do X. You did X. How did you do X? What are you know, landmines I need to look out for that could, that could create issues? Uh, do you maybe have any templates that you created when you used X that you'd be willing to share? Right? It's, a, it's a game changer, and it's a 10X magnifier on your impact on the business. So those would be... Uh, a couple things. And I would say like a, a bonus one, just to add briefly, um, we're in this kind of next generation of AI with generative AI and consumer grade AI that is going to change everything. And so we've been in a hype bubble in HR for around AI for years. I get that. You probably have AI fatigue, but we're not in that hype bubble, bubble anymore. So it, explore tools like ChatGPT, uh, Tome, and others uh, Stana even, um, that have uh, generative AI capabilities. Because if you can, Matt, these tools will be everywhere. It's not a question of if these will get adoption. These are going to change everything in the not too distant future. And so whatever time you can invest, and I don't have much free time, but whatever time you can invest in, you know, playing with these tools, learning them, experimenting with them, um, that can also be a huge uh, force multiplier for you when you're working on projects uh, and things like that in the future. I think Johannes raises a super good point here about uh, what you're talking about here, network equity and learning agility. Um, it, it definitely does come down to an investment in yourself in both of these cases. Why do you think some CPOs don't take the time to do it today? Yeah, I, I think some CPOs are too in the weeds with the demands of the job. And I get that. There is a lot of demands. I mean, this is, like I said, I've said several times, this is the hardest job in the C-suite. Um, there's so much on your plate as a CPO, and there will always be things that 
pull your head down into your desk, right? That, that make you focus on the work at hand. Um, you will never have a natural uh, free moment in your calendar to just kind of go off and do some, you know, serendipitous learning. You have to program it. And so I think that for, you know, the leaders that Johannes is referring to, you know, the demands of their jobs are just somewhat overwhelming to them. And they're not really understanding <clears throat> that for them to really maximize their, their value to both their employer, um, but also their own career, they've got to make space for this. And again, I think some are, you know, you, you also, let's be real, like there are some very old school kind of traditional CHROs who maybe don't think they need to, you know, who maybe are longing for a pre-COVID world that will never exist again. And they're kind of holding on to that. So. Uh, amazing points. We are uh, getting towards the end of this session. There, there's a f few more things that we'd like to get done, so we have to move on. But the amazing comments, both from you, Lars, but also the chat, super good discussion so far. Um, would be interesting to hear from everyone, uh, what's your key takeaway from the session today? What, what do you think is most interesting about some of the points that have been raised? Is it maybe network equity, uh, learning agility, which is one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about as well uh, as we've been going on um, today, or is it something else that's come up? Of course, prioritizing the CEO relationship, uh, amazing advice, I think, um, especially when you're putting it into the context that building trust is so important to also getting the resources you need to to do your job all right it's it does seem like some of your concepts are uh, uh are sticking with people here, Lars. Um, learning agility coming back in a lot of comments and also uh, ne network equity. Uh, so definitely some interesting comments here. This is some really, really good comments. I do want to leave uh, a couple of seconds uh, for, for Lars to also talk a little bit about uh, what you're doing outside of doing conferences with, with Sana. Uh, I mean, you have really an amazing portfolio of different activities, um, but if I'm a CPO and I'm interested in learning more about some of the concepts that you've talked about today or getting in touch with other people who are working with these challenges, um, how do I how do I do that, Lars? How do I get in touch with you or or uh, get to work with you in some capacity? Yeah, I mean, so my um, you know everything, all those media channels you mentioned are centralized in my website, uh, which is amplifytalent.com. So you can learn more about uh, the podcast, the book. Um, I also write a weekly newsletter on LinkedIn, um, where I kind of summarize some of the latest you know trends, stories, and news and all things people. Um, and then also run the Amplify Academy. And that Amplify Academy is a platform launched during the pandemic that was really focused on and all the things we've been talking about around, you know, the need to support HR practitioners as we're building this new world of work. Um, I, I felt that there weren't a lot of platforms out there that were doing a good job in helping us think through the work of today and tomorrow. They were more kind of legacy inclined. And so I launched the Amplify Academy two years ago to serve as a platform to support modern HR and people leaders who are doing this work. And so there's uh, an AI learning lab built on Sana. So that's kind of how uh, we connected. Think of it like uh, Netflix for HR learning. Uh, there's a robust global Slack community as well. And then there's also leadership development cohorts and uh, HR growth sprints, which are uh, two week activations to help build uh, resiliency, uh, learning and network equity in practitioners. Amazing. Uh, thanks a lot, Lars. So if you're interested in getting in touch with either Sana, us hosting on this amazing platform we call Sana Live, uh, or Lars and the Amplify Academy, 
um, please uh, either reach out to us um, through LinkedIn, through email, or you can also put a vote in here in the in the poll that you have in front of you right now. Um, and again, uh, this has been amazing. Um, it's been such an interesting discussion about the evolution of the CPO. And although I was primed before going into this conversation today, I, I've learned a ton. Um, so this has been really, really fun, uh, but also amazing contributions from the chat. Um, people that really took the time to write some amazing comments uh, about the things that you talked about, Lars. Yeah, and thanks again for uh, for hosting this discussion, Emil, and uh, I echo your thoughts. Thanks so much for all the engagement uh, in the chat and the questions. Um, you know, we learned from all of you as well, so thank you so much for that. It's been amazing. Um, yeah, so with that said, um, thanks a lot for attending today. Uh, we'll reach out to you who uh, um, notified that you wanted to be reached out to. Otherwise, we'll stay in touch either through... Uh, Lars website or his email that he put in the chat or through our own LinkedIn page, uh, Sana Labs on LinkedIn. Really, really good to have everyone joining today and I wish you a great remainder of the week. All right, take care everyone. Thanks for joining Lars. Thank, Thank you. you.